So before we can actually pop our undercarriage together, we need to make some wedges. We'll need to use wedges for the arms later as well. Um, so I thought it'd be a good chance to have a look at Robin's technique. Yep. Um, so you've got some elms. We're going to use some elm just because it contrasts nicely with the ash leg. Yeah. Um, but actually, does it really matter what wood? It needs to be something... I'd go ring porous, so it'll just crumble when you hit it. Go ring porous? Yeah, go an ash or an oak. Because you want it to compress? You want it to have a bit of strength when you hit it. Right. Otherwise, it just snap. Right, okay, so go for something that's tough, so that yeah. you can hit it hard and it will bang in. What about grain orientation? Do you care about that? Yeah, they want to be orientated along the grain, just to stop any snapping that might happen. Right, yeah, and uh, so looking at it end on, that's like quarter sawn. Oh, that, that, that way doesn't matter. Any. No, it doesn't that's really matter. just how you want it to look. Great. Okay, so these are obviously being sawn from the bit of elm. Yeah. It'd be quite tough um, to use a draw knife on a bit of elm, because if you just got it from a plank, you're not going to have very much. Yep. But you were saying to me earlier that actually you prefer... Oh, uh, yeah, uh, if you've got a 16 mil wide piece of dry wood, uh, long enough to stick into a shave horse, just shave a taper onto it, cut it off, there's a wedge, shave a taper, cut it off when you get another wedge. Great. Uh, so the principle of the wedge is that it wants to be the length that the sawn slot is going to be. Yeah. No, because you that need some sticking out the top, right? Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about the length of it. And what about the gradient? I've got it about 15 degrees. Right. About. But yeah. I wouldn't worry too much. If you do it any less than that, uh, it won't really open the leg enough before it's fully in. Right. What 15 degrees. Do you know what that is in kind of gradient? Like a 1 in 7, 1 in 8? Uh, I don't know the conversion to that. My is awful. We'll look yeah. that up and come back to you in a bit. Great. Okay, so I've looked this up. And so you were saying about 15 degrees. Yeah. Now for me, what that is coming out as a ratio is 1 in 3.5. Right. Which is actually twice the size that I used to do, which was 1 in 7. And yeah. those do look like twice the size. Yeah. So that's perfect. And those, those, so those look to me exactly like you say. So uh, 15 degree would be considered 1 in 3.5. Right. Whilst we were just checking the internet, I thought I'd have a quick measure of the one that we made. Yeah. And um, the wedge has splayed the leg about uh, three and a half mil, which is a little bit more than an eighth of an inch. Yeah. So I guess that's quite a helpful way to think about your wedge is by the time it's got to the bottom of the kerf, yeah. it needs to have splayed it by a good eighth of an inch. Yeah. And actually having that bulk at the top means, you know, when I used to make wedges, I can't even remember what we'd be using them for, but they'd often snap. So having mm. that bulk at the top makes quite a big difference. It really that. does, yeah. And it's a theoretical hitting the bottom of the kerf because as soon as you put the wedge in, you open the kerf. Yes, yeah. That when you feel it not going in any further, it's simply there's no space for it this way. Yes. Not lengthwise. Right. You're ready to see me yet. But you don't want it long enough that it sends a split beyond... No, nope. and there are many who say you should never saw a kerf either, always do it with a chisel. Really? Yeah. No, I like a kerf. I do, but you think gives, it out. gives you some space yeah. for a thickness of wedge, otherwise you're going to be snapping wedges left, right and centre. Yeah. Uh, That's my take on I it. I had it explained to me the other day and it left me thinking, I think either or is absolutely fine. As long as you've got they, a wedge in hard, you'll be fine. They basically all work. They right, do. come on then. This is a great technique, though, for tidying up. Yep, so we have a bench hook, which has got a little bit of wood there, so it won't slide that way. Simply with my hands well away from the front of the blade, I'm just going to put the tool on the wedge and peel off a shaving. Got to be super careful with chisels, probably the most dangerous tool in the workshop. People often put their spare hand, or they're trying to hold the bit that they're working with. Ooh, yeah. Ooh it makes you shudder, doesn't it? Yeah, but that's working great. Yep. And that's all about having a wooden version of that hand in front of you. Yes. So I'm happy with the gradient on that. I'll just put it up next to the others. It isn't overly important, but if you've got one that's got a very different gradient to it, you'll have one wedge thicker than the rest when you're looking at the chair seat. Right. 
Yeah, people will spot that. Yeah. And so what about, because these are square things going in round holes, essentially. So do you ever take the corners off or do you just let it? I quite like the corners to bite a little bit. I right. I used to. So you just make it to the, the, you make the width of the wedge to the diameter of the hole. Yeah. We've got Great. a 16 mil hole there on that, so I've just been popping them in there. Now when I'm doing this bit here, and I'm shortening it, you do see people doing it like that, and there's potential to cut yourself is there. So I'm going to put the what would be the toe in, and I'm just going to lean forward on that. And what, what if you went side on, if you did it side on like that, then you wouldn't even have to hold it. It would hold against the... Yeah, good idea. Great. Anyway, so we're going to crack on. We'll get our wedges made and then we'll take you through the whole process of gluing up and banging wedges. Is there a better word for banging wedges? Wedging. Yeah. Gluing and wedging. Yeah. See you in a bit. See you in a bit. So now we've got our central stretcher in yep. and we've popped our legs in. Yep. Everything's primed in position. We just need to join it all together. Yep. Um, but you wanted to just check that we get the wedges aligned correctly. Yes. So show us, talk us through that. Our uh, grain direction in the seat is going this way. If we were to put a wedge in along that plane, drive it in, that would be how we'd split it. So we have to make sure that the wedge, as with the orientation of the stretchers, is at 90 degrees to the grain in the seat. Yeah, so we want our wedge going in like that. Yeah. And actually, so you could have the seat the other way around. Yeah. If you've got the seat aligned the other way around with the grain coming from back to the front, then you want to have your wedge coming in that way. Yeah, just think of your wedge making a cross with the grain and you'll always get it the right way around. Perfect. Okay, so that's, we're going to... Yeah, that's too long. So I'm just going to saw a little bit of that off. I'm still going to leave it proud. I'm being very careful not to saw my seat here, or my arm. Great. Okay, so we'll do... Uh, we'll saw off the other ones and then draw... Is it just as simple as just drawing a line? Yeah, yeah. Just draw a line in the middle. Great. See you guys back here after we've done three more. Brilliant. Okay, so we've sawn the tops off the legs and I'm just gonna show you before we take it apart, we're just gonna mark orientation on the legs so when we put it back together, it's the same. First okay. thing I'll do, so we don't have to clean anything back off, is put some tape on. So what? So you're gonna so this, label each one, are this you? This is just so we know which leg each end of this okay, tape. Okay, so going talk on. us through labeling it. Okay, and then we do have to draw straight on the wood for this part. I'm just going to do a couple of lines. Always do two, because then you can line them both up together. Could you just do me one more piece of tape, please? Where's that for? So we've got number two there, and number one here. We've got one and two there, so we know that goes in that end. Leg number three. And this is just so you can knock it all back together nice and quickly without worrying that you're putting it together wrong. Great, so the two dashes are making sure that we align the tenon in the mortise correctly. Yeah. And then each leg, if you remember, we've given a number. So we've written those on the holes um, and on the legs. And then we just correspond the tenons on our stretchers. So yep. this is leg one. So it just says one there. Leg two says two there. So that we know that they all go in the right place. Exactly. Um, and then this is the one, two um, end for the sense stretcher. So it goes into that. It's pretty simple, but it's a good way of doing it. Um, and it can be a nightmare if you're worrying about glue going off. Exactly. It takes the wonder in it. I wonder if I've knocked that in far enough. Or well, you know if you've knocked it in far enough because these lines will meet. Perfect. Yep. Great. Let's take it apart and then we'll, yeah, we'll crack on, saw some curves and glue it up. Yep. Okay, before we saw the curves into the chair legs, I'm just going to quickly glue the, the stretcher assembly together just so it gets time to dry before we carry on, just so it doesn't twist while it's going in. So, 
the glue you use is your call. We're using pretty bog standard wood glue here. You can use hide glue, Gorilla glue, any glue you fancy. So any wood glue. One of the fancy. things we haven't talked about, what just wants to do in that is um, drying the wood. Yep. So we've, I suppose, kind of kiln dried it, right? We've put it, put the uh, tenons in airing cupboards yep. so that it's going to be in a situation where it's drier than it will be in normal life. Mm -hmm. um, so that way you shouldn't have tenons that shrink. Yeah. Yep. Now you saw me hammering on the back of that then. What I didn't show you is that I've, that's the wood that I'm hammering onto is softer than the wood. This is just a piece of uh, scaffold board, is it, or something? Yes, yeah, a bit of softwood. Oof. Yeah, that's a good sure fit. It goes in there. You've got to be careful when you glue it together because actually the glue will probably make the tenon expand because it's water based. Yep. Uh, so you're not going to have much opportunity for play once it's in um, for twisting around. And actually, I suppose with a tenon that's only 5 eighths. You don't want to put too much force into it because um, you could, I guess, a strong adult using maximum force could probably uh, break break the fibres just by twisting. Yeah. So you can be pretty firm with five eighths, but not not as firm as you could be with an inch. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great. We should just mark where we want to cut our kerf. Okay, so we've got the, the direction of the wedge. Yep, it's marked already. I'm just going to mark how deep I want to cut, about two-thirds of the length of the tenon. I know that's the other end of the tenon because that's where my marks are from the bottom Great. of the seat. Great, yeah, that's really handy. Great, okay, so that's all good, and now we'll just get on with sawing the cuffs. Yep. Perfect. So, do you need a ripping saw? Yes, please. Great, there we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, big safety point here. We're doing this into the end of the bench. I'm going to put my hand beyond the bench, so if my saw slips, it's going to cut into the bench. My arm is no way near it. Okay, that sounds very sensible. So, to do a rip cut, an accurate rip cut, I would start with the cross cut side of the saw just to get your kerf going because it's a bit bouncy on the other side, and then turn onto the ripping side of the blade. Beautiful. All right, so we'll do that three more times and we'll see you in a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's time to glue up the undercarriage. To avoid any confusion, we've loosely put the legs in the corresponding holes. I've checked that the stretcher assembly that we've got has got this numbered leg at each point. Now I'm going to go ahead, carefully pop some glue in here. Not too much, because any excess that comes out you've only got to clean off. Use my I have stick. got a sponge just in case. Good idea. So I've put an absolute mountain in there. And then take your leg, look for your alignment hole, make sure you, before you even put it in that you can see your pencil mark here, pencil mark here. Push it in, line your pencil marks up. One leg glued in. Great. Four to go. Four. Let's crack on. I'd say three. Three to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're in charge. <laughs> Again, quick swizzle around, make sure everywhere's covered in there. That was just a bit stiffer, so I'll get it as lined up as I can. And then I'm just going to finish that with a little tap. And again, using a softer piece of wood on the underneath. Little one. Brilliant. Great. OK, so um, next job will be gluing it up. But whilst we're waiting, 
just yeah. bang it in so it holds it in place? Yeah, just, you know, yeah. any final twist out of it. Great. Brilliant. Okay, so I've been and got my hammer and my wedges, and it's time for us to glue the legs into the undercarriage. Right, so we want to pop this out. Yeah. We want to give it a little loosen it a bit. Give it a wiggle. And tap that one. Another okay. tap. Okay. Yeah. Great. It's a good tight fit. Yeah. I'm going to put that back down exactly the way I took it off. Save any confusion. Great. Okay, okay. so gluing, put the glue in the holes again. Yeah. Um, anything else that we need to think about? We obviously just pop it back in and hammer it and then flip it to wedge it? Yeah. Remember you're driving a wedge shape into a plank, so don't go battering it too hard or you'll split your plank. Right. When you're banging the legs in? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So just drive them home and the, the glue and the wedges will do, do their job. Yeah. Listen, when we do it, just listen. You'll hear the tone change when the, the legs hit the bottom. Great. Okay. So okay. So. Don't waste any time at this stage. So, all legs in, and then. They're in. They're in up to the orientation marks we put on. Happy days. I'm going to grab that wet sponge because we're a little bit sloppy there, aren't we? Well, I say we. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. All right, let's flip it over and get the wedges in nice and quickly. Okay. Do we do this on the floor? I think we should, yeah. Okay, we've just moved down onto the floor now to pop these wedges in. I'm going to get a little bit of the glue that I've spilt and just put it on one side of the wedge. We'll explain that to you in a minute. We'll just get it in there first. Pop it in the hole. And now you're using your ears here. Listen to the tone change. You hear that different noise? It tells me that the wedge is all the way home. Again, glue on one side. Find my hole. change of tone it's all the way home okay I'll pop around the other side and put the other two in and then that's our undercarriage glued up okay so now we're going to take you through how to level your chair first thing I've done is I've run a straight edge I've got it on its edge because it's a bendy ruler I don't want it to bend so I'm standing it up while the wedges are still there you've got something you can lean it against I'm going to measure this point and this point and hopefully you get them to be level. You know, make sure that your ruler is directly underneath the piece as well, because obviously if it's out there, it's going to be a different measurement to if it's here. I get that at 19 and 3 eighths on that side. and 18 and 7 eighths on that side so we're half an inch out on this side just pop a shim under this side and have another measure it's a little bit of to and fro to get this right but you get there in the end 18 and one two three four five sixteenths 19 and five sixteenths okay so we're now level from this side to this side. Now we want a half inch drop backwards. It's called the cant of the chair going the other way. So let's have a little measure. Okay, so like I said, we want to have a half inch drop from the front to the back. So we've got that at 18 and 
can't see that very well. 18 and 3 eighths. And that is 19 and a half. Which means I need to put about half an inch on the back. I'll grab my shims. Eighteen and fifteen sixteenths. Nineteen and seven sixteenths. Perfect. So we now have our chair level. The next thing we want to do, now you might see we've got a bit of a floating leg back here. It's just going to support that a little bit so it doesn't wobble. There we go. So I'm trying to establish what the lowest point on this leg, I can draw a line that will go all the way from one leg side of the leg to the other. And I'm going to do that using a pair of dividers. So I'm going to go just above the end, tighten that, measure it, one inch, five sixteenths. Okay, so as we've just taken that measurement, it was an inch and five sixteenths. So I need to hold my pencil at a consistent inch and five sixteenths above the ground and draw around the legs. To do that, I need to make this block an inch and two sixteenths, an inch and an eighth, because I have to also take into account half the size of my pencil. Okay? So if I did that an inch and five sixteenths and then I put my three eighths pencil, I would be an inch and five sixteenths plus the three sixteenths up to my pencil. There's two things you can do there. You can cut your pencil in half and make this block an inch and five sixteenths, or you can just take half the width of the pencil away from your measurement, which is what we're going to do. the waste. Okay so the idea is to keep our pencil parallel with the ground we're using the block to do that and we're just going to take it around every leg and draw a line. So now all we need to do is cut along those carefully along those lines. Okay, so I'm now going to cut off the extra parts of the leg that I've just marked. <laughs> final job on the undercarriage is to put a nice steep bevel on each of these ends so that it doesn't cause any splits later in their life. For that I'm just going to use a carving knife and the uh, thumb pull grip. Okay that is our levelled undercarriage. Great, okay, so Robin's got uh, the seat level uh, and now the glue's dried. We can uh, take off these bits, could be very uncomfortable with those on. It will. Um, and then that's basically the seat done. It's just a case of getting, what do we call the top bit? Uh, I call it the top second floor. But I don't second know. floor, yeah. there we go. Well, arms and crest and yeah. spindles and posts. But for the now, our one job is to get these off. Yes. Okay, so How carefully, we're going to take a little saw, cut this top off, 
being very careful not to cut into the seat board. Some people have like fancy flush cut saws. Yeah, they don't. I, I've never seen a flush cut saw not damage a Windsor seat before. They're for flat pieces of wood. So a bit close there, but we got away with it. So you saw the wedge, half the wood has fallen off the wedge because we only glued one half of the wedge itself. Now the reason we do that, as the seasons change, this is going to change shape. If that wedge is holding these two pieces of wood together, as that wood shrinks, it will pull away from its glue joint. Instead, what you want to happen is when, when it does shrink, it remains stuck to the glue joint and it will make a micro crack appear there, and then that crack will close again as the wood swells back up. It stops you getting wobbly legs just gluing one side of the, tent, of the wedge. Perfect. Good tip. Right, so, and now we just need to smoothen that out, right? Because yep. that's just standing a little bit proud. So we've got uh, a very shallow gouge. Yep, and if you could just pass me that mallet next ah, time. Yeah. Please. Thank you. So if you didn't have a gouge, I suppose you could use like a spoon knife. Yeah, if you've used the scorp on here, you could use scorp, scorp. yeah. If you aren't confident with your joinery, you could make that into a little mound instead of a flat piece, and then if it does ever sneak back in or out, you never know. Mm, Making there it we flush go. is the only way that you'll notice if there's any movement in it. Right. Well, we'll notice our movement. <laughs> As I'm cutting, I'm cutting into the wood and back out again. If you take your cut to the far side, you're going to end up with tear out and you'll get a little hole in the end. So work from the outside to the middle. Come out of your cut before you get to the other side of the tenon. down to the level of the seat I'm just going to pair that last bit away without the mallet and you can go over that with uh, a cabinet scraper if you like and then a little bit of sandpaper you just leave a couple of tool marks on it either way is fine Nice and smooth, one tiny little lump there. There we go, one finished lead turn. Okay, so we've cut all four of those off now and pared them down a little bit. It's not uncommon to find a tiny little gap up the side of one of your wedges and it's very easy to deal with. So this is just one of the top parts of one of the wedges that we cut off. I can keep my fingers right out of the way here. I'm gonna cut that piece in half. Now, I think that's still going to be too big. Yes, it is. Please be careful doing this. So what I'm doing is I'm just making sure it's the right width. It being a hair too wide like it is now is actually absolutely perfect because it's going to squash in there anyway. So all I need to do now is just put a little taper on it so it'll go into the hole. There we go, a little taper. I'm just going to put a tiny dot of glue on that and then tap it into the hole. Now don't try to tap it too hard or you're just going to break it. There we go, it's in. I didn't listen for a change in tone or anything there. I just needed to know it's in far enough to fill the hole. The wedge is already doing its job. So that's aesthetic more than anything that, not structural. And that's the top done. So, uh, obviously, we need to let that yes. dry. We tied it up in the same way with the gouge. Maybe go over all of this with uh, scrapers, um, plain sandpaper. Once we start fitting our arm posts um, and spindles, we're not going to be able to get to this. So no. it's a good time to tidy this all up. Yep. 
um, and you, you can go as uh, smooth or as fine yeah. um, or as fussy as you like. Uh, and I think we'll um, probably just crack on. Yeah, one thing, if you're using powered abrasives, you wouldn't be the first person to go so deep into this that you took the structure away. So if you're, you know, if you're using an orbital sander or anything, keep an eye on how far down it goes. Yeah, don't, don't spend all day with an orbital sander. No, there's better things to do with your life. Yeah, go and watch TV. <laughs>